Welcome. You are listening to the Upper Room Podcast. For more information or to donate to this ministry, visit URFellowship.com. Everybody's got a prequel, right? And you only really know a person if you know their prequel, if you know their story. That's why we can never, we can never judge them because we don't know all that went on in their, in their past. We're only allowed one opinion of people, and that is Jesus Christ died for them. Therefore, they have unsurpassable worth. But everybody's got a prequel, and you have to know the prequel to truly understand uh, them. And I believe that's the same, that the same is true for Jesus, born in Bethlehem on Christmas morning. It wasn't like God just one day, he said, hey, I, I think I'm going to become a human being today. I'm going to go down there and get myself killed. That's what we're going to do. And there's a story that leads up to this. He didn't just say, hey, let's, you know, let's randomly choose the time, choose the circumstance. We'll just roll the dice with Mary and Joseph. It wasn't like that. There's a story before the story. And if you want to understand the Christmas story, you need to understand something about the story before the story. The prequel. And so we're, we're titling the series B.C., Before Christ. And we're going we're gonna to take a look at the prequel to Jesus coming and looking at, and we're going to look at all the B.C. stuff that leads up to the birth of Christ. Uh, and what I want to do this morning is just to go back as far as we can go. Go back to the very, very beginning and ask the question, when, this, when did this idea of the incarnation Jesus coming to earth as a human first occur? And, and why did it occur? What was the master plan behind this whole thing? Because here's, this, here's the thing. Probably if I were to ask most people in America, why Je- most Christians probably, why Jesus became a human being, why God came down to earth, what is Christmas about, the answer would probably be something like, like this. Well, we, we rebelled against God, and so Jesus had to become a human being and then die on the cross to save us from our sins and save us from Satan's oppression. Something like that. The Christmas story is usually taken as being a rescue operation, a rescue mission. We need to be rescued. That's why he came. And it's, and it's true that we needed to be rescued, and that is definitely part of why he came. And, I'm, and I may have even framed it that way a time or two, but is that the whole story? There's another way of looking at this. In fact, people throughout history have had a different interpretation of this, where, yes, the cross was always about a rescue mission. But in this other view, God always planned on becoming a human being. It was part of the master plan from the start. And the interesting thing is, you find a number of, I think, strong indications in the Bible, especially in the New Testament, that that is the case. That this wasn't just a rescue mission. The decision to come to earth wasn't made after the fall of human beings. It was rather there from the start. In fact, the reason God created the world was precisely so he could become a human being. And I found that as you frame this Christmas story this way, not, not as a response to human sin, but as the plan from the start, it really makes a difference. It opens up our eyes to some aspects of the Christmas story that we otherwise, otherwise wouldn't see. And uh, it also voids a number of theological conundrums that I will we'll talk about in a little bit. But by the way, this is going to be a little bit of a theological message, uh, but we're, we're a smart congregation, so we'll be okay. But this is kind of heady stuff, all right? We aren't? <laughs> People giggled. So, so let's get into it this morning. And I'm just going to give you one indication, one of the, the strongest indications that God becoming a human being was the master plan from the start. And it's found in Ephesians chapter 1. Now read verses 3 through 6. It says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us, blessed us in Christ, And remember that phrase. It's going to be a very important phrase. In Christ, before the foundation of the world. He blessed us in Christ before the creation ever started. Who blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world. That we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ. According to the purpose of his will. To the praise of his glorious grace with which he has blessed us in the beloved. 
Okay, so before the creation of the world, before there was anything, here's God's plan. This was the master plan, to adopt us as children in Christ and bless us with every spiritual blessing in Christ. That was the plan from the start. And the way that happened was Jesus becoming a human being and taking on our nature and then incorporating us into him. That was the master plan from the beginning, not simply a rescue mission. Now, here's, here's, here's the thing. If Jesus just came on a rescue mission, here are the implications of that. If a rescue operation plan was there before creation ever started, well, then that would mean that what we were rescued from had to be there from before the creation. So you can't have a plan to rescue people without something to rescue them from. So if Christmas is simply a rescue operation to save us from Satan's oppression and our sin and rebellion, well, then Satan's oppression and our sin, well, it must have been that part of the plan all along before the creation of the world so that God could carry out his predestined plan to rescue us from all that stuff that he predestined that we go through. And there's a lot of people who believe that, but it raises some interesting and troubling questions. Here's one. If our sin and rebellion and Satan's sin and rebellion, if that's all part of God's predestined plan, then how is God not responsible for it? Right? If I have a super smart microchip that I can put in a person's brain without them knowing it, and it controls all their thinking, all their neurons, suppose I had this microchip and I put it in, in Joe, and I program the microchip to kill Bill because I'm really mad at Bill. So Joe goes and kills Bill. There's not a sane person on the planet that, that would hold Joe responsible for that. I'm the one who's responsible. Joe couldn't help it. Once I put the microchip in his brain, even if he thinks he's making the decisions, he's not because I'm the one making decisions. And so he couldn't do otherwise given that I've planted that microchip in his head. You're only responsible for the stuff that you have a choice in, right? You're not responsible for how tall you are or what color eyes you have because you didn't choose that. You couldn't help it. That's just what was given you. You are responsible for your actions because those are things that you choose. So if Joe couldn't help but kill Bill because I microchipped him, he's not responsible. I am because it was my choice that brought about the death of Bill. Okay, so in the same way, if it was God's plan, if it was God's decision from the creation of the world that we would fall into rebellion and sin so that he could rescue us, then he's the one responsible for all of it. Second thing is, if, if Satan's sin and our sin, if it was all part of the predestined plan, then the suffering that comes from it was also part of the predestined plan. And it means that the, the decision to have uh, 10 million people killed in the Holocaust, every atrocity, every disaster, all the human heartache is part of the predestined plan of God. And now you've got a pretty monstrous view of God. And then I read people and I hear people sometimes say, oh, but somehow it's, in some way it all glorifies God. And the people who say that are, they're sincere and smart and godly people, and they're usually just reciting what they were taught and what they believe. But I'll confess to you that I don't have a clue what they're talking about. It sounds to me when people say that all the nightmares of human history glorify God, it sounds to me like they're saying that all the, all the evil and suffering and pain of the Holocaust glorifies Hitler. And there's a, there's a sense in which that's true, but is that the kind of glory we want to ascribe to God? I don't think so. Look at what the Bible says. I love this verse. Hebrews 1.3 says that Jesus the Son, he is the radiance of the glory of God. The shininess of God's glory and the exact representation of God's very being, his essence. This is what God looks like. This is the glory of God. When God shines, it looks like Jesus Christ. Especially Jesus Christ dying on the cross for us. That glorifies God. It puts on display his self-sacrificial character, his, his perfect love. So if it doesn't look like that, if a person doesn't look like that or an event doesn't look like that, don't ascribe it to God. If it looks like self-sacrificial love, well, then that glorifies God. 
give, the, give God the credit for that. But if it doesn't have that kind of character that's revealed in Jesus Christ, it glorifies someone else. Satan or fallen human beings or whatever, but it doesn't glorify God. Only what looks like Jesus Christ should be ascribed to God. He didn't go around causing disasters and sicknesses and disease. He went around healing them. Right? He redeemed bad situations. That's his glory. He didn't cause them. Here's the third thing. If this all was part, has been part of the predestined plan, the whole mess of the world is part of the plan, so that God could then carry out his predestined plan to rescue us, well then, all of our decisions are part of God's predestined plan. And that would include our decision to submit our lives to Christ and fall in love with Christ. That was part of the predestined plan. But if our choice to love Jesus is part of the predestined plan, then is it really love? It seems to me it's not. Right? Let's go back to the microchip again. About 22 years ago, I first started getting googly eyes from my, from my beautiful wife. So I'm thinking about asking her on a date, thinking about asking her to marry me at some point, and suppose I want to make sure that she says yes. So I put a little microchip in her head uh, when she isn't looking, and I, I, I program this thing to make her fall in love with me. She doesn't know. She thinks it's all her decision. But I know that, in fact, she's loving me, um, quote, unquote, loving me because of the microchip. Is that genuine love? I don't think so. It's, I have a Stepford wife, right? Well, it's, it's only love if she's the one choosing it. That's the only way that it's genuine love which means she has to have the freedom to choose. She has to be able to choose not to love me. It's only valuable because of the choice made. Now, in this case, the poor girl didn't stand a chance. Uh, she just couldn't resist me, but, but she, there was still... Just, I was a hunk in high school. So there, was, there, was much, there was still free will involved. There's a little bit of freedom there. She could have chosen otherwise, and fortunately for me, she chose to love me, and we've been choosing that ever since. So think about this. If God pre-programmed who's going to love him, he also pre he's pre-programming who's not going to love him. Because he obviously didn't program everybody to love him. So now you have a God who's, whose glorious plan is to have people go to hell before they're ever born, before the creation of the world. These people were destined and that's a pretty ghastly picture of God. It's a picture that can't possibly be true because it doesn't look like Jesus Christ. It doesn't look like Jesus Christ giving his life for all of humanity at the cross. And it, and it contradicts a ton of passages in the Bible, especially the New Testament, that tell us that God's love is for everybody and that Jesus Christ came for everybody and that God wants everybody in. 2 Peter 3, 9, for example, says, The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that anyone should perish, but, but that all should reach repentance. So if you think that God's predestined who's going in and who's going out, I think you got a seriously conflict, conflicted picture of God because he created this verse and others like it. He wants everybody in. But he makes some that never have a chance. Some people right now are going, this is a, this is a miserable Christmas message right now. <laughs> It'll get better, I promise. We've we got to get somewhere with this, okay? But, but all of this is kind of the result of thinking that the plan from the start was simply a rescue operation. Would anybody like to hear an alternative explanation to this? All right. Okay, so here's the thing. In church history, going back to the very beginning, I would argue this was the majority view of early church fathers, um, but the alternative view is that Christmas was not a rescue operation. It was the centerpiece of God's master plan from the start. And the cross was added to a later after the fall, but the plan to become a human being was there from the start. In this view, God creates the world and creates human beings precisely to invite them into his triune love. Triune is just a fancy word for trinity, right? Triunity. Whenever I say triune, just be, just be thinking that that's the love of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, that perfect, unsurpassable, unimprovable love he's had from, from all eternity. But out of the fullness of that love, he wants to create others to invite them into that love. 
From the start, God had wanted to incorporate humanity, all of humanity, into his heart to share in the joy and the love of the triune God. And because love has to be chosen, he gave human beings free will. So people can say no to this if they want. But God's plan from the start, in this view, was to create human beings and then however long it took to court them, as it were. And then the, the plan from the start was whenever he saw that human beings were ready, whenever our heart, hearts were solidified toward him, then the plan was, was to marry us in a sense. And that's why God's people throughout the Bible are referred to as the bride of Christ. God wants to be in an unimprovable, perfect relationship with us where he would join himself to us so that we can then participate in him and participate in the love that he is. And the way that would happen would be through the incarnation. God would at the right time become a human being, become one of us. This was the master plan from the start, to, to open up his own being for us to be included in Christ and then share and participate in the love of the triune God. That's why it says in Second Peter uh, 1, 3 through 4, I think, I messed that one up. He says, His divine power was granted to all, to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of Him who called us to His own glory and excellence, by which He has granted to us His precious and very great promises, so that through them we may become partakers of the divine nature. We don't become God. It doesn't work that way because that would be less beautiful because he wanted to create other non-God people that would share that exact same love with him. It's a beautiful, glorious plan. And it all centers on this incarnation and God becoming a human being. Now let's go back and read uh, Ephesians 1. It makes a big difference on how you frame Ephesians, to how, to, to how you understand the meaning of Christmas and, and why God became a human being. So let's go back to Ephesians 1. Paul starts by saying this, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace with which he has blessed us in the Beloved. So that was the plan from the beginning. He wants all human beings to be in Christ. That's what the incarnation is all about. Him joining himself to us that we could be joined to him. Him taking on our nature so that we can participate in his nature throughout, throughout eternity. That was the plan. He chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless before him in love. This isn't saying that God chose us before the foundation of the world as opposed to someone else. What's it saying? What God chose from the foundation of the world was that whoever was in Christ will be holy and blameless and adopted as children. That's what was chosen. Now what we have to do is choose whether or not we're going to be in Christ or not. But once you make the choice to be in Christ by surrendering, surrendering your life to Christ, all that is predestined for who's in Christ is now yours. You become holy and blameless. It'd be like saying this. Suppose, uh, suppose Larry over there, or Larry, there's Larry. He asked me, hey, Chris, when did you decide we're going to talk on this topic? And I can say, well, actually, I thought about talking on this topic about two months ago. So Larry can turn around and say to you all, Chris predestined that two months ago that we're going we're to hear a message, hear this message. And you all say, yep, amen. But it wasn't predestined that you were going to be in the room to hear this message. It was predestined that whoever's in this room is going to hear this message. So now that you're in the room, you can say it was predestined for us. This isn't God picking eeny, meeny, miny, mo. Who do I take and who do I let go? No, God's will is for everyone to be in. His love is towards all. And then he says this, and this is, this is where the message starts to get good, okay? Mas it hasn't been great so far, but this is going to get better. It says this, He predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace with which he has blessed us in the beloved. So the third time he talks about being in Christ, in the beloved. All that takes place in the beloved. 
He says here that we are blessed in the beloved. In fact, it's why he created the world. He wanted to incorporate humanity into his triune fellowship, the perfect love of the triune God by having us be with him. So now, so, so now what it means is, is this. We are in Christ. And so all that is true about Christ becomes true about us. This is, this is amazing. This is glorious. Here's a very simple illustration of being in Christ, okay? This summer, our, my family, we flew to Florida. Okay, we booked a flight. Uh, we drove to Pittsburgh super early in the morning, found a parking spot, jumped on the little shuttle that, that drives around there, took us to the terminal, stood in the security line, got to our gate. Finally, we got on the plane. And everything about me changed once I was inside that airplane. And here's what I mean. I don't know. I'm guessing I could maybe run a mile in eight, nine minutes right now. The first one. The second one is going to be like 22 minutes after I vomit. But, <laughs> and then they're just going to progressively get longer. And longer. The fourth one, I'm crawling. But once, once that plane took off, I was moving at 400 miles an hour for two straight hours. And because I was in the plane, what was true about the plane became true about me. I began to see things from a new perspective because I was in the airplane. I saw the earth in a different way. When we talk about being in Christ, we're talking about this kind of fundamental shift in who we are, in what we can do and how we see. Everything changes when we're in Christ. And this idea is everywhere in Scripture. Throughout the New Testament, the New Testament, the phrase, in Christ, is near constant. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. If I'm in Christ, then the old has passed away. And the new has come. Old shortcomings, old failures fall off. New abilities are mine because I'm, I'm in the plane. I'm in Christ. Romans 6, 3 through 6 says, Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in the newness of life. For if we have been united with him in death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. You see here this, this union with Christ. As Christ was killed and was buried, so we were with Christ. So we with Christ died with Christ and were buried with Christ so that we, we might be part of the resurrection of Christ. We might also be raised to walk in newness of life. This is all union with Christ. This is what is true about the airplane is true about me because I'm in it. Being in Christ means we can, we can celebrate that our identity is in Him. It means we are a new creation. It means that we are being conformed into the image of Christ. In Christ, we have the righteousness of God. Look here at 2 Corinthians 5.21. It says, For our sake... He made him to be sin who knew no sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. We don't become Christ. Now God's always wanted another to love and relate to. But now that we're in Christ, all that is true about Christ becomes true of us. And so the love of the Father that the, the Father has for the Son is the same love that the Father has for you. And for all of who, who are in Christ, it's, it's not even a secondary love. It's not, not even a separate act. In the process of loving Christ, he's loving all who are in Christ. Because whatever is true about Christ is also true about whoever's in Christ. So the infinitely intense, unwavering, unfathomable, unimprovable love that defines God himself the love that God the Father has for the Son is now directed towards all who are in Christ. And it means that you could not, at this moment, right now, be more loved than you are. Just think about that for a second. 
It is a love that doesn't, doesn't go up when you're having a good day. doesn't go down when you're having a bad day. doesn't go up because you're feeling warm and fuzzy. doesn't go down because you're, you're feeling cold and apathetic. doesn't go up because you've had a good week. doesn't go down because you've backslidden. doesn't go up when you've got it together. doesn't decrease when you're all messed up. doesn't improve when your theology's all straight. Doesn't go down when you're all got nothing but questions. It only depends on one thing and one thing only, and that is, are you in the beloved? And if you're in the beloved, then there's no if, ands, buts, or maybes. You are loved with an everlasting perfect love. Praise God. This beautiful master plan looks like Jesus. This looks like Jesus. This makes me want to praise God, this, this plan. <clears throat> Jesus gave his church two ceremonies, two sacraments, right? For some of us, that might be a little too Catholic, but I like it. Some say ordinances, but I like sacraments. He gives the church two sacraments in which the church is to celebrate the union with Christ. Um, that's what... All this is about, to celebrate the union, our union. The first is the sacrament of baptism. It's what we do after we confess our belief in Christ. As a mark of obedience, we come forward and testify. I've given my life to Christ. I'm here to publicly profess that he's my Lord. And we're going to have a baptism on the 16th, correct? Is that right? Two weeks from now? And you can talk to Greg about that if you're interested. And our baptistry is right over there. Um, and I'm going I'm to let you in on a secret, okay? So you have to keep, it, keep this between us, okay? We fill that with city water. <laughs> we don't get our water from Jerusalem. We're getting it from the same place you're getting it. What makes it holy is the heart behind it. Right? Baptism is getting in the water and allowing the church to celebrate together the union of Christ. Think about what happens. You get in the water and you testify, the Holy Spirit opened my eyes. He saved me from this. And then, then you plug your own nose because if the other person does it, uh, they'll hold it too loosely and flood your sinuses or they hold it too tightly and give you a nosebleed. So you hold your own nose. Somebody else gets in. They dunk you underwater, representing what? The death of Christ. Buried with Christ in his death. And we don't leave you there, Right? Pull you back up. For what reason? To be raised to walk in newness of life. Then the church goes nuts. We celebrate. We applaud. This is a good sacrament God gives his church so that we might celebrate our union with him. That's not the only one. See, you're baptized once, right? We don't get baptized every week, right? Baptism is done once as a public profession of faith in Christ and a public celebration of union with Christ. Then Christ gives us gives the church communion, the Lord's Supper, the Eucharist, so that we might celebrate often, so that we might be reminded of our union with Christ. And this is just, it's bread and grape juice. But what makes it holy is the heart behind it. If the ushers want to start uh, passing out communion, and uh, Lee and Tiffany... And Michael and Emily are going to come up. Uh, they're going to do a song for us. If you don't know, Lee and Tiffany are up from Nashville. Flew up here for, for our Christmas banquet that we had last night. They're awesome, fun people, fellow believers. We're glad to have them with us. Um, they're going to share a song with us during communion. And the, and the whole history of the people of God is that we are people that are prone to forget. We're always prone to forget the goodness and grace of God. Think about how amazing the claims of grace are. Think about how hard it is to believe that our identity is in Christ. Think about how hard it is to believe that our, you know, you're in a plane flying at 35,000 feet at 500 miles an hour. It's hard to believe. So Jesus says, you're going to forget. My people are prone to forget, so I'm going to give them this as a sacrament so that when you gather, you're reminded that I'm for you, not against you. That you're in the beloved. You're reminded that my body was broken and my blood shed for the forgiveness of sins. 
I want you to remember that you are in me and that in my death, your sin dies too. And in my resurrection, your Holy Spirit-empowered living is accomplished. Communion is that space for the Christian to be thoughtful about the union with Christ. It is that space to stop, to think, to reflect, to realign, to confess, and then to rejoice. The ushers are passing out the elements. Take communion as you're ready. time foundations of the earth and sky you saw it all and said that it was good the joy was said before your eyes you knew that you would give your life you saw it all and said that it was good
Father, thank you for our union in you, Lord. Thank you that there are so many of us are in the plane, so to speak, that our identity, as much as we wrestle with it from time to time, is in you. That you have given us, you've given us new desires, new abilities to say no to sin, that you're conforming us, that we get to rest in your righteousness and not strive for a righteousness of our own. Thank you for how you've blessed us with spiritual blessings in the heavenly realms, Lord. I pray that we would remember. Remember things that we're prone to forget. And not just remember them just as intellectual facts, but that we would recall and remember when you opened our eyes, when you softened our hearts. Lord, we love you. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. Hey, I love you. If you want prayer for any reason, come on forward. If you're, uh, if you're not a believer and the Lord has done something, there will be, there'll be men and women here. They're, they're, they're simply here to pray for you, to answer your questions, really serve you in any way that they can. All right? Amen. Have a great week.